So thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to discuss this topic together. So I'll start first with the diagnostic criteria. These have changed. I think most of the audience is familiar with this. And here's a table showing the evolution between 2008 and 2016. And the biggest change is a lowering of the hemoglobin hematocrit threshold. The bone marrow biopsy is now <clears throat> included as a major criterion, along with some form of a JAK2 mutation. And a minor criteria is the erythropoietin level. So we wanted to start by introducing the diagnostic criteria. And we'll discuss this this afternoon in a little bit more detail. But this talk mostly will focus on prognostication and therapy and whether we have this correct. So before going into the details of how we assess prognosis, I thought I'd provide you with a broad overview about how we manage polycythemia vera in 2017. And here are our goals, to relieve symptoms, to reduce the risk of thrombosis, hopefully we could prevent or delay transformation, and to also effectively manage the patient through special situations, an example being the perioperative period. And for all patients, no one will disagree that together with the primary care doctor, we should help manage cardiovascular risk factors. It's pretty well established that the hematocrit target should be 45% or less with regard to phlebotomy. And for all patients without any contraindication to aspirin, we should be prescribing low-dose aspirin. And you can see that phlebotomy and aspirin, the references are here. We have high-quality data, randomized data, to support those practices. And most will agree that if we perceive a patient as having a high risk for a future vascular event, that we offer cytoreductive therapy. So let's start with thrombosis. And thrombosis in polycythemia vera is quite prevalent, especially at the initial presentation or the first year surrounding diagnosis. The rates shown here, depending on the series, anywhere from 12 to 40%. And most patients with PV will experience, or in patients who experience thrombosis, it's more common that they'll experience arterial thrombosis compared to venous thrombosis. But this does appear to differ by gender. Younger women are at greater risk for venous thrombosis. And some patients will have small vessel disturbances. These may not change prognosis, but these definitely change quality of life. And even after a patient has been recognized or officially diagnosed, there's still some risk after diagnosis. And this risk is anywhere from 2.5 to 4.5% per year. And this depends on the era of diagnosis and the risk of patient. There's no doubt that thrombosis and PV impacts prognosis. A low-risk patient who has a vascular event becomes a high-risk patient. And clearly, in 2017 still, management of PV is heavily focused on reducing a risk for incident or recurrent thrombosis. And so many of the strategies that we showed in the table before, aspirin, blood pressure control, phlebotomy, cytoreductive therapy, all of those geared towards vascular risk reduction. So clearly thrombosis is important. So if it's very important, and if it very much guides the management of polycythemia vera, we do have to effectively risk classify patients. And so this is how we risk classify patients in 2017 still. And we're looking at those variables in red, a prior history of thrombosis and or advanced age. And these are consistent, but these are really pretty generic. You could take any patient in your hematology practice and apply this, and if they had this variable, they'd be at higher risk for recurrence. So this doesn't necessarily capture all of our patients appropriately. So what we need to move towards is a more precise or individualized risk classification for thrombosis. And I think in seeing these patients, we know that there is a multifactorial set of contributions. There are many etiologies, many provoking risk factors that can increase the risk for a PV-associated vascular event. So of course, erythrocytosis, that is a hallmark feature of PV and definitely associated with thrombosis. But leukocytosis as well, there have been correlations with arterial and or venous thrombosis. And we can look at mutations. And basically, I mean, virtually all patients with PV have a JAK2 mutation. But a subset who have an increased allele of burden might be at greater risk. And if we look at a recent paper, and this didn't focus solely on patients with PV, it looked at a much larger, broader population. It looked at the association of chip mutations with coronary heart disease or atherosclerosis. And among those chip mutations, and there was clearly an association with, between these mutations and vascular risk, 
JAK2 is weighted heavily, but you can see that some of the other mutations that also associated, TET2, ASXL1, DNMT3A, these can also be seen in patients with PV. So the mutational profile will perhaps in the future allow us to better risk classify for thrombosis. And these mutations, the mechanism by which they may accelerate coronary atherosclerosis could be mediated via inflammation, and inflammation has been shown to increase thrombosis risk in PV. And one of the potential variables, high sensitivity CRP, that was published this year. Cardiovascular risk factors, I think everyone agrees that if they're present and uncontrolled, we must address them. And recently, a study by Dr. Barbui showing that hypertension in low-risk patients upgrades risk, so we might need to treat those patients more aggressively. Gender, there is a gender difference in the thrombosis risk. This has been shown by a couple of different series, including Dr. Teferi's large series. And there is an association between gender and venous thrombosis, and younger women especially have a greater likelihood for potentially catastrophic events, hepatic vein thrombosis. We're still looking for surrogate markers or biomarkers that <clears throat> we can apply in clinical practice, and we don't have a front runner that we would use in clinical practice just yet, but Italian colleagues have looked at microparticles and APC resistance, as well as markers of leukocyte endothelial and platelet activation. So we still need more precision, but that's the point. So the next part of establishing a prognosis, first we're to try to predict risk for vascular events. Next, we're, try to predict, we're to try to predict the risk for progression, especially to myelofibrosis. And here are two bone marrow biopsies, and one is in a chronic phase of PV, hypercellular, and if you looked close, there's clustering pleomorphic megakaryocytes. But over time, some patients are at risk for evolution, and this next slide is a patient who's progressed to post-PV myelofibrosis. This is less cellular, there's streaming fibrosis. The prevalence of this complication is probably 5 to 15 percent at 15 years, and those at risk are older, those who have had a longer disease duration especially, perhaps those with leukocytosis at diagnosis, marofibrosis at diagnosis, since we can talk about the possible impact of a bone marrow biopsy at diagnosis later this afternoon, but if you have a little bit of fibrosis at diagnosis, it's intuitive that you'll have more fibrosis later. The allylic burden, greater than 50%, has been correlated. And in this era, <clears throat> the additional non-JAK2 mutations, which have been identified in patients with PV, they also increase risk for progression. And these are the three that Dr. Teferi found an association between in PV and features of progression. So first, thrombosis. Second, to try to predict progression. And of course, what's very important to a patient is to predict overall survival, longevity. And so here we can start with some historical data. And some patients still will stumble upon this when they're looking on the internet. And they'll find very, very old studies suggesting that untreated PV has a life expectancy of 6 to 18 months. But that's from 1962. The next historical um, era when we look at prognosis is that from the PVSG. And here we learned about the negative impact from our practices, the negative impact of certain prescriptions. And here we learn that certain therapies, which are rarely, if ever, used in the United States at present, are leukemogenic, chlorambicillin P32. So there can be a negative impact from something we prescribe. So in contemporary PV, and this is a study from 2013, and then there's a little bit more in the way of an update, the three variables that one might use or one might think about to assess prognosis have to do with advanced age. This is weighted most heavily, age over 67, leukocytosis at diagnosis, and the presence of venous thrombosis. And you can see that this is going to classify or categorize a patient into one of three groups with a very different survival, 11 years versus 28 years in a low-risk patient. We're using next-generation sequencing, and I'm not personally using this in my clinic for patients with polycythemia vera, but there are recent studies showing that certain variables or certain markers are adverse. They might impact the risk of leukemia and survival, and those are the three in PV, ASX01, SRSF2, and IDH2. So that's the background about how we're attempting to assess prognosis for a patient, thrombosis risk, myelofibrosis risk, and risk for death, premature death. So let's next look at management of therapy. Do we have it right based on our prognostic abilities? 
And so our first goal, and this is the goal that, this is the most strong influence on treatment decisions in polycythemia, it's vascular risk. So I think we, we do have an evidence base to support a hematocrit target of 45%, and we do have an evidence base to use aspirin. And there's a consensus, a general agreement, that cytoreduction reduction is indicated in higher risk patients. But whether we have this right, there are a few more details that we need. And I've made an argument that in terms of vascular risk, we need more pre precision. I think there are certain patients that are undertreated, and there might be patients that are overtreated with cytoreductives. Should there be a gender difference in the hematocrit target? I don't think we'll really ever know. I don't think there'll be another study. There won't be another high quality study just looking at phlebotomy. So this will probably remain unanswered. And we did survey largely academic providers, and it was basically a 50-50 split. Some use 45% universally. Others prescribe a more aggressive target for women. So this is gonna be individualized. Is hydroxyurea really the best frontline agent? And if we look at the data to support, really there's a scarce evidence base, but hydroxyurea really emerges because of PVSG studies showing that other therapies were more harmful in terms of leukemia risk. Finally, we have frontline comparisons. We have randomized comparisons against another agent, and these are the studies comparing hydroxyurea to interferon that we're gonna learn more through the course of the day. Preliminarily, interferons are non-inferior. The next point, if inflammation associates with thrombosis risk, does using an anti-inflammatory drug potentially modify this risk? Does using a JAK inhibitor for PV modify thrombosis risk? I'm not sure we can answer that with the data. The study design wouldn't allow it to. It wasn't a pre-specified endpoint, but there is a lower event rate. So this is a question that remains to be seen, but an intriguing one. If a patient has a, thrombos a thrombotic event, how should we manage? In addition to phlebotomy, if this wasn't already underway, if a patient wasn't already on aspirin, if a patient wasn't on a cytoreductive, if those things are already in place, what should we do with anticoagulation? And this is still an unanswered question about how long we should treat a patient for a vascular event if we're using an anticoagulant. What is the proper anticoagulant of choice? Should we use a direct oral anticoagulant or other? This is not answered. So we still have <clears throat> more work to be done in terms of managing vascular risk. Next, if we're looking at the goal of preventing or delaying transformation, <clears throat> and this is a very challenging goal, should we change our treatment paradigm? Currently, a newly diagnosed or a low-risk patient <clears throat> is going to start on phlebotomy and aspirin, and we wouldn't necessarily, most would not start an agent with a specific goal of delaying progression. But are, are there intriguing agents? And the answer is yes. Interferons are the intriguing agent in this regard. And there are studies, some of them nearly 10 years old, that have renewed our intrigue in these medications. The French PV study, just under 40 patients, a study from MD Anderson, many of these previously treated, both studies showing impressive hematologic control. <clears throat> the first study showing no thrombotic event over six years follow-up when 10 would have been expected. Molecular emissions in a minority, some sustained after discontinuation. So there's definitely intrigue, and across the board, if you look at, <clears throat> and this is probably true in ET as well, if you look across the board, the discontinuation rates in these studies are somewhere around 20%. But there's, there's definitely intrigue to use these agents and to perhaps consider them early. Finally, we have high quality randomized studies underway presented last year at ASH and we expect that they're gonna be updated again this year. So here's a, a possible treatment paradigm shift, treating an early, a young, lower risk, early PV patient. And so, I do use uh, pegylate interferon in certain patients. I'm very selective regarding performance status. Patients who have limited comorbidities, I think this is a drug or a class of medications that works best early rather than late, especially when splenomegaly is modest. <clears throat> and if we ex extrapolate from some data presented last year in myelofibrosis, perhaps these agents work better if a patient lacks an additional non jak 2 mutation. If the molecular profile is less complex, perhaps a better chance to have a better molecular response. Still, there are questions. There is perhaps a short-term negative impact on quality of life. And second, it's, we've all seen patients who have been on hydroxyurea for 10 to 12 years, but do we see many patients who have been on interferon for a similar period of time? So that remains to be seen whether we can use this for most patients long-term. 
But there is intrigue, and the intrigue is that there's an early impact blood count control. We can address splenomegaly perhaps when it's modest, perhaps reduce the thrombosis event rate. But later, if we think about anticlonal activity as a surrogate for changing natural history, and there have been case reports or case series showing changes in uh, the bone marrow histology, perhaps this is an agent, not confirmed, but perhaps this is an agent that could delay transformation. So we'll finish with our goal of relieving symptoms. And, and largely in, a, in PV practice, in most clinics, we're focusing on thrombosis and vascular risk, and we're focusing on that for the first five to 10 years of illness, and thereafter, our thinking shifts. We're more attuned to watching for progression. But whether a patient is newly diagnosed, whether a patient is high risk or low risk, there's definitely a, a specific burden of symptoms that patients with PV have that impact quality of life for the negative. And these are shown, they can be cytokine related, vascular in nature, some do herald progression, progressive splenomegaly or constitutional symptoms if they were never present to begin with. So we have to keep symptoms in mind and not just focus only on vascular risk classification. And here, here's another thought about the symptom burden and whether we should be using certain medications up front. So it's been shown by Dr. Mess's group that <clears throat> certain symptoms shown here, and these are, these are the inclusion criteria for the response study. Patients who were included in the response study required phlebotomy, had splenomegaly, and were treated with hydroxyurea. So they looked, Dr. Mess's group looked at the association between these components individually and the symptom burden, and each one on their own was associated with a moderate increase in the symptom burden. So the question is, should we use an anti-inflammatory type agent up front in patients with this burden? I don't yet. This is not yet well studied, but this is, is a thought about how we might shift our paradigm in the future. And last, communication. This is another important study by Dr. Messa and Dr. Mascarenas, looking at the discordant perceptions of patients and physicians. And this would probably apply to a lot of scenarios in chronic illness. But first, it was the patient's perception that physicians, we are underestimating symptom burden at diagnosis. And second, importantly, there are discordant treatment goals. If you look at, if you survey patients, the most important goal for patients in this study was to prevent or delay progression. If you asked MD respondents, it was to prevent or to prevent an incident or recurrent vascular event. And it's not that physicians don't want to prevent or delay transformation, it's just that physicians aren't yet aware of an agent that can effectively accomplish this. And last, the concerns regarding communication. More than a third were not very satisfied with communication and management. So the take home points in this first talk about prognostication and initiation of therapy and whether we have it right, Therapeutic decision-making is largely based on vascular risk assessment, and I think we do need more precision in this area. A goal of therapy is, of course, to prevent or delay progression, but whether we have an MPN-directed therapy that can reliably do so, this remains to be seen. And whether we should shift the paradigm to treating early low-risk patients, that also remains to be seen. Clearly, we need to incorporate symptom assessment into routine care, and we need to make decisions not just based on vascular risk, but the burden of symptoms. A patient with overwhelming or uh, fatigue or very troubling pruritus shouldn't be simply observed because they're young. And clearly, we need to work better on communicating, communicating our goals early and to try to make sure that they're in sync with our patients early on. So with that, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention.